All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jackie Shaheed, and I run campus recruiting for Guardian. On behalf of my colleagues at AIG, Aon, Chubb, Gallagher, The Hartford, New York Life, Prudential, and Travelers, I'd like to welcome you to today's event. Over the next few sessions, um, you will gain insight into the many opportunities and diverse perspectives within the insurance industry. You'll also have an opportunity to strengthen critical skills for success during this virtual recruiting session. So we're excited to engage with you. To begin our programming, I am excited to introduce Charla Floyd, Senior Vice President of Strategic Initiatives at Gamma Iota Sigma. Um, Gamma Iota Sigma is the leader in collegiate talent pipelining for the industry and has been a tremendous partner to the industry for decades. Um, just a reminder, uh, during her session, if you have question you'd like to ask, please submit via chat and we will have Charla answer uh, your question towards the end. Thank you so much for your leadership um, and your time today, Sharla, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie, for the kind introduction. I'm honored to join you all today. Um, as Jackie said, my name is Sharla Floyd. I lead strategic initiatives, industry engagement, and student-focused diversity and inclusion efforts with Gamma Iota Sigma, which is the industry's premier collegiate talent pipeline. But what does that mean? Gamma is a vast network of over 5,000 students, uh, 25,000 alumni, connecting you to and preparing you for the breadth of opportunity in the industry. And I'll say more about that in a moment. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> First, huge thanks to everyone who made today possible. Thank you for the kind and generous invitation. Thank you to the sponsor companies, uh, our esteemed industry colleagues, my dear friends, Savea Chubb, May and Dominique at AIG, new friends, Jackie, the inspiring industry representatives will be sharing their insights and expertise this afternoon. What an incredible opportunity. But special thanks and welcome to you, to students. You represent the future of talent. So thank you for investing your afternoon in exploring, exploring this extraordinary industry. I understand that many of you are coming to this event with vastly different experiences and levels of fami familiarity with the industry. So to begin, I'd love to pose the question. Next slide, please. What do you think of when you hear insurance? So please, if I can encourage you all, humor me, use the chat box, pop a word in there, a phrase. What is it that comes to mind when you think of insurance? I'll just give that a moment, see what pops up. Yes, better safe than sorry, precaution, security, coverage, liability, risk management. Okay, some more sophisticated answers, car wreck. <laughs> Financial risk, risk, customer service, security, safety net, these are great. Cars, healthcare, security, health, state farm, safety, protection plans. These are all fantastic. My kids think of commercials. <laughs> they think of specific functional areas too. Peace of mind, yep. Life insurance, investment, personal information. Yeah, data, that's something we'll talk about too. Can be expensive. Mm -hmm. These are some great answers. I wasn't sure how folks would be <laughs> warming up at first, but yes, necessary, right? So, Huge thanks. This is, it's great to start. I love starting off with, uh, with a little bit of interaction and um, you all have incredible insights already. And uh, so I think that you're light years ahead of, of where I was at this age, thinking about the industry. Um, but next slide, please. I hope you also think, when you think of insurance, I hope you also think of opportunity. And this is a lot of information here that I'm especially sharing for those who are newer to thinking about this industry, to contemplating a career in this industry. So as you can see on this slide, it is replete with opportunity. It tends to be a skewing older industry. Because of that, there's tremendous opportunity with the retirement wave that's fast approaching. Um, hundreds of thousands of jobs, that number seems to be a, a moving target, depending on which study is coming out with it and when. Uh, but the fact is tremendous job opening opportunity. Um, and even in spite of how this and every industry has been hit by COVID. Um, insurance is such a necessity 
that it really can resist uh, recessions, extreme impacts like that. So really a wonderful soundproof uh, industry. And you can also see some really compelling stats that would have spoken to me when I was a sophomore or junior thinking about um, viable career paths. 1% unemployment rate in this industry. Can't think of any other industry like that. And a 98% job placement rate, which I can really only couch for gamma GIS uh, students. Pretty consistently high across the board because of that need. And that's all great, but still, for those of you new to insurance, what does this mean? What is insurance? You've mentioned some fantastic answers, but really insurance is everywhere. Uh, I think many of you even said that. It is the engine that makes the entire economy run. It fuels every aspect of our lives. Health, home, travel, political risk, cyber. America runs on donuts, well, the world runs on insurance. There is an entire ecosystem made up of customers and users. These can be individuals like us, they can be companies, government entities, organizations. All of those customers work with agents or brokers to ultimately receive coverage from carriers, not to mention reinsurers, TPAs, a host of an ecosystem that exists uh, along the way in which every imaginable functional area is employed. Why that matters is that you can find your place in this industry regardless of your major. And we'll talk about that too in a moment. The next slide please shows where Gamma fits into this. So I'll say a little bit about context for where I'm coming from and how you as the future of talent fit into this industry. Perhaps the most vital role that Gamma plays in the world of insurance is in growing and diversifying a vibrant talent pipeline. How do we do that? Through exposure. First and foremost, and kind of only, through exposure. My good friend, Dr. Leroy Nuttery, regularly touts how critical exposure is, and he asserts that you cannot pursue a path you neither know exists, nor where you can see yourself. So exposure is so, so critical, and the burden falls on every single industry representative to help provide that exposure to students of all backgrounds at schools everywhere. Exposure is vital, representation is vital. Some of these stats you can see, uh, and this is how Gamma's 5,000 plus students break down. We're at approximately, we're actually closer to 100 schools now. It's a fast growing network. It's open to all students regardless of major. Um, and I think the, the breakdown of our majors is pretty compelling. Historically, we've been very heavy with RMI, which is the risk management and insurance uh, major segment, but also actuarial science. And over the past eight or so years, we've seen that shift tremendously. And the 27% who indicate that they have a major other than those two, that's our fastest growing segment. That used to be reported in about 2011 as 4%. So that shift has taken place because of exposure because of the industry telling its story, because of industry representatives connecting with students, and because of students themselves as the best ambassadors connecting with their peers to showcase all that the industry has to offer. Um, on the next slide, we can see that our Gamma said council, so this is a student-led and student-focused council. Uh, said stands for Solutions for Authenticity, Inclusion, and Diversity, and this is such a vital voice and initiative within Gamma. Uh, it's open, as you can see, to all DNI officers and students, but it's also open beyond. We have students at schools that don't have Gamma chapters who participate in this discussion. We recently had Sabe from Chubb join us to speak to some of Chubb's efforts in this realm, talk about what the, the cultural shift looks like within Chubb with regard to commitment to, to diversity and uh, equitable recruiting. Uh, but it's also an incredible force where students are committed to exactly the awareness and action that's listed on this slide. The student voice and perspective, there's a lot of best practice sharing, it's a forum for discussion, it's a forum for helping to provide a continuum from the student experience into the industry. The industry has a host of different uh, engagement opportunities to ensure that it is as diverse a place as possible, whether it's employee resource groups, ERGs, or a number of different names for those business groups, uh, BRGs. The point is, this is an industry that is aware of and committed to enhancing diversity within it. There are a number of different initiatives underway. The Gamma Said Council is really a cornerstone in the student um, perspective in driving that. So we connect very organically with our chief diversity officer partners. As you can see, there's a number of different ways that we empower the student voice, um, continue to 
plug that in, in national speaking forums to ensure that the industry and the, the student experiences are copacetic so that they're not operating in a vacuum because otherwise you have two entirely different um, experiences of what DEI means. So the Gamma Said Council has been extraordinary in driving uh, growth within not only Gamma, but also as that populates into the industry, which you can see, we have the 25,000 alumni that grows every year because we have graduates every year. <laughs> so uh, further driving the diversification of the pipeline through students working across their peer networks to provide exposure. That's networking with students of other majors, Black Student Union, the Latinx groups on campus. Any student group is open to participate in all that the industry has to offer because, again, it comes back to the exposure. The industry is hungry for fresh talent, and this is an extraordinary way to uh, to obtain that. So exposure fuels knowledge. With knowledge, you can forge your path. And in this industry, the paths are really limitless and exciting. So with the next slide, I'd like to engage you again, understanding that you're primarily sophomores and juniors. So kind of on the younger end of the academic spectrum, think about the path that brought you here. And again, in the chat box, I would love to hear a little bit about what was your ultimate deciding factor in your school choice? The path that brought you to your school, how did you make that decision? Was it a friend, family member, a fellow classmate? Did a faculty member reach out? Those different junctures of exposure are so critical and they are paralleled within the industry. Some kind of exposure is the catalyst for you to pursue a path. Um, I'd also love to hear in the chat whether what the exposure piece was that brought you to this event social media, a friend, how, how, what are those points of exposure? Because that worked for you and understanding what your hook has been to incite interest in this industry, that can be replicated. It's not a zero sum game. We wanna know what the most compelling points of exposure are so that we can encourage other students to take a look at this extraordinary industry as well. I'm gonna take a look at the chat box to see what, Friend brought you here, yeah. Other majors, right, so that can open your eyes to possibility. How comfortable I felt within the school community was the biggest factor in my school of choice. Totally understandable. Friend that works at Cigna, Illinois State, shout out to them. <laughs> Internships, internships, of course. Siblings, career coaches, Jackie and I were just talking about that, uh, that kind of career coaching and how influential it can be, not just for the person you're doing it with, but for yourself too, to open your eyes to all that's available, right? An exploration of a path, exactly. Math and data analysis, location, affordable. Cost is a huge factor here. You're investing in your future. You're not gonna make that decision lightly. Family members. So not surprisingly, those driving factors mimic how people enter any industry, any career path. Um, have an hour, right? Yeah, and it's cheap, exactly. Possibility for new opportunities, right. Um, when I think about my path, it's, <laughs> it's sometimes surprising to folks. I went to Mount Holyoke College, which is a small women's college in Western Massachusetts which Dominique from AIG actually <laughs> shared that she happened to spend a, a, a summer in high school. Um, so there was that fun, small world uh, effect. But I was in art history. I studied art history and international relations. And yet I'm working for an insurance education nonprofit. So what's that bridge? Um, because of my dad's job, I grew up all around the world. He speaks a bunch of languages. We kind of have a competition. I want to speak more. I'll get there. <laughs> but I was fascinated by the convergence of art and in the international environment. Uh, so I was a grant writer at a museum for a number of years. Ooh, which women's college? Molly McNutt. <laughs> you go to Matt, oh, Matt Holyoke is here, Barnard, awesome. I'm so, so glad to see your, you coming to this and getting the exposure, big shout out. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I was a grant writer at an art museum and I wanted to do my job better. And I think you see a lot of this career build and growth within the industry where you want to see another side. So I ended up looking for a, an opportunity as a grant maker to understand what that process looks like. Lo and behold, I find a, an opportunity to manage the corporate foundation at ACE, which is now Chubb. And 
it was the fastest and most compelling immersion into this industry. I get excited talking about it because I worked with great people. Our leaders were extraordinary. I learned so much about the industry that I had no idea about prior. When I left ACE, it was not a light decision. I left ACE and then I came to Gamma to work with students. So before I did that, I contemplated whether I could take my art background and potentially apply it in an underwriting capacity, working with museum collections, art galleries, individual art collections. My point in saying that is that each path is unique. You know this. You don't only have your major, but you also have your passion. And what I find so rewarding about this industry is that it is everywhere. Everything touches it. If you're a scuba diver, there's marine insurance. Are you an amateur aviator? There's aviation insurance. You can find your path that marries your skills, your functional wherewithal, and your passions. And it really is limitless. Uh, so that's a little bit about my path. I'm going to do a quick time check. <laughs> and let's see. So the next slide, thank you all for your, uh, for your feedback in the chat. That's fantastic. Represent. <laughs> I know you're gonna be hearing uh, more about some of the non-traditional paths in the industry and you will continually, whether you're new to insurance or you've um, taken a few classes or maybe you've taken a couple of years of worth of classes, you'll hear some very regular terms. It's a very um, acronym heavy industry as many are, but you'll get used to them. Um, and so certainly you'll hear underwriting, actuarial, but this is a great representation. These are all of the different career paths that we have housed in the Career Resources Hub within Gamma Eta Sigma. Um, our website is completely open to all. We want to be transparent about all of the resources and exposure that we provide to students and our industry partners. So we're continually sharing best practices, single access point for the industry for the student perspective, single access point for students to access the industry. Because no two schools are alike, you're not going to have the same industry representation and therefore not the same awareness of what exists. We try to aggregate that and make it as clear as possible. So this is a brief overview. By no means is it complete. This is evolving. Part of what I was asked to take into consideration uh, in, in giving some remarks today is the evolution of insurance and how those new and emerging and burgeoning segments uh, are shaping the industry, but also the talent need. So you'll see on here, we've got the data analytics. If we move to the next slide, uh, we see how that relates back to majors. There is a place for you. There's a place for every single major, whether you go directly into it or you study what you are studying and you can still find your path. Um, one student that I like to talk about is the, I think now past, not current, but past president of one of our chapters, who is a double major, Japanese and international business. But this young man has taken a number of SOA actuarial exams. He will not come up on the radar as an actuarial major, but that's his path. He's studying what he's passionate about. He's going to pursue what he's passionate about, too. So there's no need to ever have to change your major, maybe take some additional classes, depending on what it is that your school offers uh, to be able to get the exposure. Certainly always reach out and connect with the industry professionals within your area. Trust me, they want to hear from you. There's no industry person who doesn't want to hear from students and the fresh talent and make those direct connections. Um, so there's another listing of just of the the, the majors that are available, we've recently forged a partnership with InsureTech Connect. And by exposing these new and burgeoning segments, that hooks a whole other type of student. And what that does is that lets those students hook a whole other type of student because maybe they're connecting with their marketing major friends to say, this is an industry that could work for you. So I, uh, <laughs> with this brief overview, I want you to really see that the sky is the limit. There is so much enthusiasm for you you are here representing the future of this industry. So let that sink in for a minute. You'll be told this in countless capacities, especially as you approach graduation, but the future is riding on you. It is. This is a fundamentally innovative and evolving industry, and it depends on fresh talent like you to come in and shape what is next. Only you can set your path, but know that your path is filled with opportunity with resources and with so many people cheering you on. I encourage you to keep your eyes open along the way. Pick up the phone, call somebody, connect, make those connections, nothing's more valuable. Um, reach out to me on LinkedIn, I'm an open book. I love to connect with students. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you for your time. Next slide has my contact information if anyone would like to reach out. But I think if we do have a couple minutes, I'd love to field a couple questions. 
Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Sharla. Um, any questions at all, please feel free to ask. Um, you know, we, we thank um, Sharla for sharing her insights. Um, I mean, it was, you know, in a, such a short period of time, it was such valuable information. So please feel free, we'll give you a few minutes if you have any questions. I can talk a mile a minute sometimes and you, you get excited. It really is an industry that, that inspires so much. That's a great one. What is your favorite part about working with students? Um, I'm trying to think through, I have like 10, but my favorite part of working with students is the continually fresh perspective. My worldview is continually challenged in the most beautiful and productive way on a daily basis, daily. Before I joined this meeting, um, I was having a call with, with a good friend of mine who is a current student talking about a lot of different diversity issues within the industry. It's like these philosophical calls that are also career guidance calls and it's, it is so fulfilling. Uh, major sports management, how can you do sports marketing? Do a search, do, truly. The, we, we have the internet at our fingertips even more so in this challenging virtual time. Um, do a search on LinkedIn, find somebody who's operating in that realm and shamelessly reach out, shamelessly reach out, ask what their path was. How did they get there? You may not be able to do it immediately, but you can build to it, map to it, find a place that, that actually has that as an offering and express your interest. People are hungry to help you. I think that's an important thing to know. You know, take the risk. The answer is always no until you ask, or if you don't ask. <laughs> uh, what stands out about the insurance industry versus other fields? I think you're gonna hear a lot of different answers to that over the course of this afternoon. Um, for me, it truly boils down to my cheesy tagline that the world runs on insurance. It is everywhere. Everything is affected by it. Um, and I, I love that you can find the convergence of your passion with your path. Um, not to mention the fact that it's really rigorous <laughs> with, uh, it, there, there are some extraordinary starting salaries for you as students, regardless of your major and functional area. Um, it is a recession proof industry. You've seen what's happened with the economy with COVID. Insurance can't go away. By design, it can't go away. It is a stable career. Uh, let's see, I think I've take a couple more. Um, field of actuary. I encourage you to talk to some folks through today and, and make a point of networking. The actuarial field is evolving itself and complex. So that could be a whole other. <laughs> um, what if you have what if you have no experience in the field? That's the the um, Another one that I'll take. And then please feel free to email me any questions. I, I'm happy to continue the connection. But if you have no experience, this goes back to where, um, like I said, we're a single access point for students to the industry and for the industry to students. And we want to ensure that we are sharing best practices and concerns with our industry partners and specifically with our recruiting partners. So as a matter of course, we do an annual student recruiting survey and the data is so compelling every year. It showcases the importance on the impact of exposure. 41% of students who are exposed to a new field go into that new field. Um, that's pretty powerful. But also the need for internships even earlier on. We inaugurated a project-based internship just to get little bits of exposure set in the wake of a number of internships getting canceled. So I think always speaking up and asking for, if it's not an internship that's available, maybe there's a project that you could tackle to at least get your feet wet in that industry. Um, so I could go, Perfect. On and on, but yeah, uh, I'm sure, Charlotte, I'm sure we can definitely go on and on. You've yes. got great background, um, but thank you. And again, like Charlotte mentioned, feel free to email her. Yes. Um, we are going to move on. Our, we have an exciting um, session um, pan with a panel highlighting non-traditional pathways and careers in insurance. So I will turn it over to uh, my colleague, Jeff Brzezowski. Thank you. Thanks so much, Charlotte. I think you're just, this is Dominic. Okay, hi, Jeff. Can you, hi. are yeah, you I hearing to, us? I, I can, thank you. I had to find my unmute button, so thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Okay. And thanks Sh welcome. for uh, a great presentation uh, from Gamma Iota Sigma, certainly a great industry partner to, um, to many of us on this call today. So um, I'm just gonna quickly introduce myself and then we're gonna kind of get right into the panel here. So I work for Travelers and University Relations and I'm gonna be your host and moderator for this next session which is taking a little bit of a different slice and approach to the conversation around careers that Charlotte talked about. Um, she highlighted many of the very traditional careers and pathways that do exist in the industry. 
And our four panelists are gonna kind of talk about some non-traditional or non-industry associated pathways and, and also some non-traditional backgrounds as well. And they're gonna hopefully tell their story to you today um, to learn more about you know, how they got where they are and their industry experience. So as the panelists are now showing up on video here and um, getting ready for this panel, um, I do encourage you that if you um, have questions that you're thinking as you go through this next session to do type them into the Q&A box as opposed to the chat box. So the Q&A box would be where you can actually um, type a question. We have some preset questions, but we are going to try to get to as many of the additional questions that come in at the end of the session. So um, with that, I think we'll get started. So next slide, please. All right, so this is our esteemed panel. There's me at the bottom left, um, and, and I'll go from left to right here. I'm gonna quickly introduce each panelist, um, and then we're gonna go right into the questions, and we're gonna have um, some time at the end, hopefully for some additional ones. So first of all, we have Jenny Trong from, uh, from Aon. She's the COO with the New Ventures Group. We have Jasmine Zamora with Chubb, who is in a PR and community relations role. Tara Fosbury with Guardian, who is a second VP in technology. And last but not least, Newman Rochester with Prudential, who is a VP in business development. So welcome panelists, and I thank you for your time today and for giving students your, your feedback um, and experiences. So uh, my first question is really for Newman and then Jenny. Uh, the question is, how did you first hear about insurance and what motivated you to pursue an opportunity? Sorry, uh, Jeff, I was having some um, computer issues. Is, is that a question for me? Yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, just in the nick of time. So hello, everyone. And it's awesome to be on this uh, fantastic um, panel. And so um, as, you, as, as, as the topic says, untraditional past. So for me, um, I was a first generation um, college student in my family. And so we didn't talk about insurance at the dinner table. I still don't, uh, even though I've been in insurance for 20 plus years. But um, truthfully, it was a uh, back then. We used to look at um, uh, the newspaper for um, potential jobs. So I was probably about three and a half, four years into my uh, undergraduate degree, wanted to um, pursue, um, just wanted to make money, truthfully. Saw a position I could make like $400, $500 a week. I thought I was going to sell a million dollars of insurance on a yearly basis. And I started off selling accident and health insurance door to door, business to business. So um, for me, it was just the motivation was. Uh, I wanted to make money and I wanted to be um, what I thought was successful. I didn't realize how hard it was going to be to be an agent, but um, that's really my first um, stint in the insurance industry. So turn it back over to you, Jeff. Thanks. Great. And how, how about Jenny for you? What's, what's your story? How did you first hear about insurance and what motivated you to pursue an opportunity? Yeah. So thank you so much for having me on this panel. I, um, I went to my uh, undergrad at the University of Michigan. So I was actually in Detroit area. And um, having immigrated to the US and, and English is not my first language, um, it's my third. And uh, you know, I, when I was going through university and actually my entire life before that, I was actually geared toward going to medical school. And so how am I here in the insurance industry 22 years on since university and um, what had happened was I was pre-med. I was, um, you know, took a lot of science courses, physics, chemistry, um, mathematics, and, uh, and biology, of course. And I ended up with a biology major, but um, and I actually expanded to get my second major in economics. And at that point in my junior, senior year, I decided that I was no longer going to be pre-med. I was going to go into business and that I, instead of medical school, I was going to go to business school. So um, I was in Detroit and because of my background, um, I knew that I wanted to go into a firm and work in a global environment my whole entire career. And in Detroit, obviously a lot of the industry or a lot of the companies are you know, in the automotive industry. And, um, and obviously they're multinationals, but I was really looking for a firm that I can join where I can work in a multinational environment straight away, rather than getting into a multinational company, you know, where I work in, you know, one part of it that's more maybe national, domestic. Um, and I happened to come across this company by the name of Aon. And um, Aon has a 
team uh, that looks after multinational clients. And I just happened to have found it uh, shortly after university and fell into uh, the insurance industry that way and have been here ever since. Do you recall, Jenny, what motivated you about that opportunity to Aon to pursue that role? So I, um, Aon at the time, we had a group called Global Business Unit, which is called Global Client Network today. That's part of our, uh, one of our business lines or solution lines as, as we call them today. So you would enter that group basically working on, you know, a few large global clients, but you're working with colleagues from around the world. And because I was in Detroit, um, and at the time our office in Detroit was actually in downtown Detroit, so it was in the um, headquarter where General Motors um, is. And General Motors at the time was divesting a uh, part of its uh, business, which at the time was called Delphi Automotive Systems. So I was uh, fortunate to go into the um, office at Aon and start working on those two clients. And of course, learning from the ground up, I you know, didn't know anything, right? Um, but the huge motivation behind it was really the opportunity to work with colleagues from around the world. And I truly mean around the world. And this is at a time when, you know, we weren't using internet the way we are today. We weren't using technology. And I still remember, you know, standing in front of, I'm going to date myself, um, but standing in front of a fax machine to fax something over to a colleague in, you know, a country, right? Um, but it was really that opportunity to work with colleagues from around the world. And if you think about the number of countries that General Motors, you know, have operations in, those are the same number of countries where I was liaising with colleagues around the world. Thank you for clarifying. That's great. So um, my next question, we're going to start with Jasmine for this one. Um, so thank you, Jasmine. So what do you appreciate about working in the insurance industry? Thank you. And thank you for having me today. Um, you know, there's so many ways you can answer this question, but I really wanted to break it down just into three um, easy bullets that I think everyone on this call can relate to no matter their career background. Um, and that's purpose, opportunity, and variety. And I found that these three themes um, in the insurance in industry are very prominent. You know, for myself, being part of CHOP has given me purpose. Um, just knowing that we're helping people with the coverage um, they need um, to help them protect and prepare for the unexpected. Um, opportunity, you know, being part of the world's largest property and casualty insurance company, um, you know, you really do have the opportunity to be successful. You know, you put yourself in situations where you are able to leverage the tools, the development, the internal networking um, to really take your career where you want it and ensure that you're continuing to build relationships along the way. And that'll help you then garner that next um, opportunity. And then the last point, variety. You know, I started as a communication specialist. Um, and now I have added community relations and diversity and inclusion under my skills and expertise. Um, again, the variety of people that you meet and collaborate with, um, coupled with the growing needs of the insurance industry, creates variety for you to grow you know, in your own career. I think just the insurance industry in general is going through a very transformational and pivotal point right now. Um, with technology, with diversity, and just the way that they're looking, um, you know, to release products into the marketplace. So it's a very exciting time for insurance. And definitely, if you look five years ago, when I started, um, it's, it's really exciting to be um, part of that continuous change and involvement. That's great. Thank you, Jasmine. How about for you, Tara? What do you, what do you appreciate about working in the insurance industry? I think you're on, there you go. I am, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, sure. <laughs> thanks for having <laughs> me today too. Um, I think my answer is, is similar to Jasmine's. Um, I would sum it up by just saying the culture. Um, having started my career at Chubb actually, um, and then going to media and then financial services, I have come full circle back to insurance. And really what I loved about Chubb, which was the culture and Guardian where I am right now has a very similar culture, you know, doing the right thing, feeling like you're contributing to, you know, the greater good 
very supportive culture and one that has a lot of mobility opportunities to learn and try new things. That's great. Thank you. All right. So the next question, we'll start with Jenny for this one. So what has surprised you the most about working in the industry? I think um, I, I joined earlier. I think I heard Sharla talking about how insurance industry kind of you know, powers the economy. Um, and I think from that, that's one of the main things that I've learned in this industry in that it really, as an industry, we really touch every facet of the entire world, right? And, and I remember, um, you know, and, and, and related to that, um, it's just how vast it is. You know, Jasmine talked a little bit about this. There is so much to learn um, and there is so much to do inside an insurance industry that you could, um, you could be a generalist, you could be a specialist. Um, you know, I've been with the company for 22 years and every, I would say every one to two years, I pretty much had a different job and I worked in three different geographies. Um, so, you know, there's just so much to learn. Um, the opportunity is just so vast. You could be, you know, a specialist in a specific industry vertical, or you could be a specialist in data privacy or in an actuary. Um, you know, we run the gamut. There's just so much expertise that is needed um, to help our clients solve some of their really complex issues. And it really takes uh, the entire insurance industry to help with that. Thank you, appreciate that perspective. So Newman, how about for you? Like what has surprised you the most about working in the industry? Um, just to dovetail on a lot of the points that Jenny uh, made, it's, it's the overall variety. Um, for me, I've, I've, been, I've been a financial for eight years. I've spent probably about 20 years in the financial services industry. This is my seventh company. And so within that, to Jenny's point, it's the, I've been able to be so mobile in my, my career. And I would say if you're looking at a job or position and it's just, well, let's just do this job forever, um, that just wasn't really the right path for me. I, I was interested in a lot of um, different things. And so I found myself spending almost every, I've done every single role in distribution. And when I moved over to Prudential, um, almost to, to Tara's point earlier about the culture, um, they hired me not in a sales role, because there was a hiring freeze, but they hired me as the um, head of kind of business intelligence and analytics. And so I was scratching my head, like, why on earth would the um, head of business intelligence hire a sales guy? Um, but then I, I realized, and a philosophy major to boot, and so I, I, I realized quickly that it was about um, blending the technical as well as the uh, business um, language and the knowledge. Um, now I find myself leading the business development efforts for Prudential on the life insurance side. So I'm spending all of my time in the insure tech and fintech space. I'm talking to clients that aren't the Morgan Stanley's and Merrill Lynch's of the world, but the clients that are in Silicon Valley trying to disrupt life insurance. Um, Prudential bought a, a, a small acquisition about a year ago, Assurance IQ, for almost $2.35 billion, plus $1.15 in uh, growth targets. That's a significant amount of money for a old um, established insurance company. But I, I think the ability for insurance companies like myself to just be nimble in the marketplace, Chubb, Guardian, Aon, um, their services, I think that just shows you the breadth and the depth of the industry. And, um, and regardless of major, right? I, I, I sit with economic majors, but also history and art. And um, our opinions are just as valuable. So those are my thoughts, yeah. Jeff. Thank you, Newman. Yeah, and I'm hearing themes of opportunity and and um, and you know you know even across the different companies and and working for different organizations. So that's great to hear. So our next question, I'm actually going to ask Jasmine this question to start. So um, as some of you alluded to, you know you have kind of your own unique path to insurance and the role you're in the role you're currently in. How do you feel your non-traditional path influenced your career growth and how you have approached your current role? So we'll start with you, Jasmine, on this, and we'll go back to Newman. Yes, that's a great question. So like many insurance professionals, and as we heard even a few of our panelists on this call, um, insurance was not my first choice when it came to industry. Um, growing up in a you know Mexican household, that's not something that we talked about, as Newman alluded to, at our kitchen table. Um, so when I was in my job search, uh, I was looking for a position that aligned um, with my skill set and my values. 
And at the time, um, Combined Insurance, which is a subsidiary of Chubb, uh, was looking for someone uh, who spoke Spanish and was really able to elevate um, Spanish communications. So I applied and, and five years later, I'm still here and not even doing the same role that um, I was hired on. So really exciting. Um, I think, you know, just a quick piece of advice is, you know, to really look for a culture and um, the skill set that you want to contribute to versus just looking at the job titles. I think there's so much to say about uh, when you interview with a team and really ask great questions um, that propel you to the career that you want. Um, and then just to add to that, you know, due to my cultural background in writing, um, it allowed me to further, you know, grow as, um, you know, a multicultural talent and really bring my ideas and my strengths to the forefront. You know, I started uh, really working on more visible projects and projects that allowed me to get closer to senior management. And once you start, you know, opening yourself up to those visible opportunities, that's when, um, you know, more comes at you because you're able to be trusted and you've been able to complete and move a project forward. And I think that's really how I've been able um, to influence my own career growth. Um, just a brief example, when I, you know, started at um, in insurance, I was managing, you know, smaller volunteer um, events and smaller scale philanthropic efforts. And at this point in time, I lead a national community relations program, um, a budget, and also establish, you know, our strategy um, for the entire company from a CSR community relations um, perspective. And I think that in everything that you do, no matter what, um, you should really elevate your skill in a way that's, you know, authentic to you, um, be visible and, you know, take initiative. So I think those are the things that have helped me personally. Yeah, thank you, Jasmine, for that insight. That's great. So Newman, how about for you? Like, how do you feel your non-traditional path you've alluded to has influenced your career growth and how you've approached your various roles that you've held? Yeah, thanks, uh, Jeff. And um, geez, I wish I was as thoughtful about my career as Jasmine um, is. Um, <laughs> certainly, um, if you don't have a mentor yet, Jasmine would be an awesome person to connect with. Um, just almost dovetailing into what Jasmine mentioned, right? I started off as a pre-med major. Um, and it was very easy for my Jamaican father and my mother from Alabama to brag that her uh, son is a, a pre-med major. Um, and then once I took a elective and um, I transferred up to Montclair State where I got my degree. So I went to school to play basketball down in Virginia. And I'm like, I like philosophy. And my mother and my father are both like, what are you going to go on the beach and um, read a book? Because what are you going to do with a philosophy degree? Um, but I had a uh, passion for it um, about how folks thought. I thought about maybe getting my um, law degree, uh, but I think the reason why I share about the, the major, it was because I knew for myself, I just needed that eight and a half by 11 piece of paper that I just figured it out. A lot of the jobs I was looking at and looking into um, after I tripped over that sales role I, I mentioned earlier were needing that college degree. And um, I'm like, you know, well, I think I can do anything. Um, let me just take, take a stab at it. And so I think recognizing that I think Jasmine mentioned it I wasn't trying to follow the traditional path because I didn't have one for philosophy but I knew I wanted to work in a building and I wanted to travel and carry a briefcase that was kind of my goal when I, I was a kid but um and I, and I think what I've heard from uh, Jenny from Tara from Jasmine and others is the culture right and so I think um my father when I went went off to school again first generation he was like and, and I was I was there to one the Jamaican accent but he, he's like, Junior, what, what you're going to learn there um, is great, and I'm so proud of you. But keep in mind, about 75% of what you're going to learn is just common sense and how to treat people, right? And I, I truly feel that um, we all talk about the culture of the organization that we're in because, you know, you, you do have your people that you don't really want to um, spend a lot of time with. But for the most part, um, people that just want to treat people the right way, people that are just looking to drive value in the business. So for me not having a, a traditional career path exposed me to some different things. And lastly, to um, end, um, Bachelor of Arts degree. And then I'm like, you know what? After 12 years in the business, um, I like being in business. I want to be better at it. And so li listening to podcasts and trying to consume as much information just wasn't enough. So that's when I pursued my executive MBA 
um, at UConn and open up the doors for my mind a bit more. It was hard to win stats and accounting and finance because I didn't have a uh, background in it, but um, it was where I, where I wanted to be. So even though you may start with that you know, philosophy degree or art or whatever, uh, what you decide to ultimately do in your career, to Jasmine's point earlier, um, it's up to you. And building your network the right way is um, all, all the things that I've taken with my untraditional path. So turn it back over to you, Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Newman. I appreciate the transparency. That's a great story. So um, Tara, so the question I have for you, and then we'll, we'll wrap up with Jenny, and I see there's questions coming into the Q&A box, which is awesome. So Tara, so what do you feel, what do you want to tell students about the future of insurance careers, maybe industry specific or non-specific you know, careers? Why should students be excited about all the career paths insurance firms have to offer? Yeah, that's that's a, a great one. And I, I think it was either Jasmine or Jennifer that said it. You know, the, the time is now. There's so much opportunity. I think students should be excited about insurance because it's evolving fast, faster than fast. And there is something for everyone to do, whether it's business, technology, security, data. Um, insurance really has it all. We are not a sleepy industry. We are tech savvy, progressive thinkers and good problem solvers. And I think based on those of us that are on the panel, we come from such different backgrounds, but a perfect example of us all finding a home in insurance because there's just so many opportunities. Yeah, excellent point. Jenny, from your perspective, why should students be excited about the insurance industry and the career paths it has to offer? Yeah, I, I think that for the insurance industry, um, you know, similar to what Tara was uh, describing, there is so much convergence with other industries when you kind of start to think about um, how you need to actually bring ideas from a lot of different places to solve very complex problems, right, for our clients. And, um, you know, and a lot of it in the future is going to be so technology and data analytics enabled um, to um, solve big problems that historically haven't been solved yet, right? And, or some new emerging problems that didn't exist previously. So, and I think if you, you know, if I just, I was kind of chuckling on, you know, what Newman was talking about earlier, but like, I, I kind of think about like, my own non-traditional path at Aon. Um, and one of the things that I thought was funny when, when Newman was talking about, you know, when he joined in, um, he has a sales background, he went to business analytics or business intelligence. Well, I had a similar experience um, back in 2015 when I went from the business side into technology and security. And I was talking to our CIO at the time who was like, hey, I want you to join me. And I was just like, I'm sorry, do you have the right person? I have no technology background, right? And, uh, and he's just like, yeah, no, I've got plenty of those. And um, I actually need a person who is business savvy and who has been with clients. And so there is just so much to learn. And, and when you, um, you know, if you ever, you know, look at my own history, you would think I maybe have a really bad case of AD&D. You, know, you know, I just, I, I just have... I'm all over the place, right? And so, but that is all just to say that there is just so many different varieties of things you can go do. Um, you know, client facing, non-client facing, internal data security, privacy, marketing communication, you know, PR, charity work. I mean, you you name it. And any industry, um, you know, I had the privilege of moving around the world uh, with Aon. So I got to see a lot of clients in a lot of different in industry verticals, you know, from entertainment to food services, to automotive, to manufacturing, to retail. And um, the sky's the limit. And I think you just need to focus on, you know, doing a really good job in your current job, right? And yes, you wanna focus on kind of the next career, the next job, I should say, but you also wanna focus on the present and do a really great job at that. And the opportunities a lot of times just kind of, you know, reveal themselves to you. That's great. Thank you. So that concludes the, uh, the, the questions that we had prepared for our panelists, but I do see quite a few questions coming into the Q&A box and Dominic, I think you might be monitoring that. Um, so we've got still 10 minutes, so I'd love for the panelists to stay on and take a couple of these questions. 
So um, yes. go ahead. So Jeff, yeah, thank you so much. And thank you so much to our panel. Uh, really appreciate all your insights. Um, we have a couple of questions. So I will first um, read the question from Aaron. Thank you so much for submitting, Aaron. Um, Aaron asks, as a business information technology major focusing in cybersecurity, what advice can someone from the panel give for someone trying to get their foot in the door in the industry with no experience in the field yet? Might be the question for Tara, just given she's in the technology space. She's raising her hand. Go for yeah, it. Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, that's a that's a great question. I think um, my general advice is always be open to possibilities, take risks, um, try things that maybe you didn't think you would like or that would lead somewhere. Um, case in point, uh, each of us has, you know, a very windy road that we've traveled to get to how we've gotten here. Um, so, you know, don't just look for the perfect match, look for opportunities to get your foot in the door because that's really all you need. When I started at Chubb, that's all I had. I, I started as a temp and within two weeks I was hired into a business underwriting area. And then from there, they saw something in me that I never really even thought was there. And they sent me over to the technology area. And that's how I started in technology. So the, the best thing you can do is take that risk and just start networking and get that initial exposure. Absolutely. Thanks, Tara. I'm going to give another minute for others to submit their questions. Um, I know we have quite a few people logged in. Maybe our, one of our panelists, though, can help. We do have a lot of students in here who are um, freshmen and sophomores as well. So we do have quite a few juniors, too. But for freshmen and sophomores, where internship opportunities may be lesser, are there any things that people can be doing now to kind of prepare themselves for possibly the following summer in terms of learning about the industry or um, kind of just getting a little bit more prepared than they may be right now? Um, I think this is, you know, a very similar question to one that was maybe posed earlier to the previous segment of this um, today's session to Charlotte, which is um, there's so much information that's readily available, um, in, you know, in the public domain about this industry. And so the more you're willing to invest the time to, to go research and read about it and make connectivities into uh, people in the industry, um, you know, that's going to help you, right? Aon, Aon runs internship um, over the summer. And I just think that the more that you can demonstrate that you have, you know, done your homework about the industry and really, you know, showcase your passion in learning about the industry, um, you know, the, the, the better it is going to be, you know, to help you in positioning yourself and getting that internship. Thanks so much, Jenny. We have a few more questions, um, so I will jump right in. Um, Jasper asks, um, has working in insurance made you feel like you're giving back to the community? Um, I'll, 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 I'll take that. I think at, at first in my role, being in um, sales, I absolutely felt that way. I felt I was uh, doing just really good work, educating uh, consumers about uh, why they need certain aspects of insurance and how it can protect against kind of the future unknowns. But then when I migrated from that into different sales roles and at the executive level, um, I've learned that a lot of our, our companies that we work for um, do a lot of good when it comes to um, um, social responsibility, right? Um, foundations and funds that not only are giving back to the community that we have offices and locations in, but how are we investing responsibly as well. So just knowing that I, I work for a, a company and we all do, we all have a lot of those foundations um, makes me feel good that we are doing some really good work out there, um, but we're also giving back in a more meaningful way, right? And not just um, throwing money around, but also um, really making sure our employees, everyone is uh, pitching in and engaging. If I can just add to it, I think that, you know, for many insurance companies you look at, um, the multicultural communities that are underinsured. And when you work for a company that's really invested in those communities to further educate um, and really teach them the fundamentals of what it means to, to have coverage for you and your family, that in itself makes you feel so good. And 
I think when you work for, you know, like for us, Chav, that's global, um, you really see the ins and outs and how you're really impacting um, communities, not only locally, but globally. Um, and then as Newman mentioned, you know, taking an active role in those community uh, relations events with the company, I think that's a way in itself to differentiate yourself from the competition is what have you done um, to change the narrative, you know, in your respective area, you know, line of work or just um, in your community itself. Thanks so much, Jasmine. And I think we have time for just one more question before we go to our next session. Um, and I think we'll um, pose this to the women on our panel. Um, one of our attendees asked, um, how do you rise within the executive ranks as a female? Any best practices? I think this is a good segue also into our next panel, which is focusing on diversity, but would love your perspectives, Jenny, Jasmine, and Tara on this. And Newman, if you feel, want to join in as well, feel free. Um, I don't know if there's one specific technique because, you know, you, you generally find yourself um, in any situation where you are, you know, I'll just, my personal example is I find myself in a lot of situations where I'm the only, right, the only female in the room or the only Asian in the room. Um, and, and I think the one thing that you know, I've learned over the course of my career is um, one is, um, you know, you really need to obviously develop your um, content expertise so that you can actually have a credible voice at the table um, so that, you know, you can be heard and, and people will respect you for that. But the other thing that I would say is, um, you know, and this is one thing that I've shared with some of our colleagues when I was in Poland a couple of years ago, our high potentials, which is um, get comfortable being uncomfortable um, in any environment. And, um, you know, and that is really kind of, you know, take, helping learn to figure out where to take calculated risk um, to figure out how you can actually, you know, grow your career that way. And, you know, that can apply to, you um, in, in, you know, in your personal life, you know, as an example. So if you are um, able to travel at some point in your future, you know, be in a completely foreign environment that you're not, you know, cust you know you're not used to, that is a great way to, to learn about how you would adjust and adapt to a very uncomfortable environment. Thank you so much, Jenny. And I'm just looking at the time, um, and so I'll just turn it over to Jeff just to kind of close this out. Um, and thank you students for submitting your questions. Looking forward to hearing more from you um, throughout the rest of the afternoon. Yeah, thank you. And thank you to our panelists. We really appreciate your time and your expertise today and sharing your, your stories and your background. It's been great to virtually get to know you just in the last 30 minutes. And um, I just loved hearing your stories. So thank you very much. So. Um, and I know there's some questions in there. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, you know, I will answer some of them, I think, that are even directed at travelers. So thank you again, students, for, for chiming in on the, on the Q&A. So with that, we're going to transition actually over to our next panel so we can skip forward the next couple of slides. And, and um, my new friend and colleague, Dominique, is going to lead what we're calling Diverse Voices in Insurance. And it's our, it's our second panel of the day. And um, she's going to take it from here and, and uh, lead a discussion on diversity. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, I think that was a great panel. I learned quite a bit. So excited um, to move into our next session. And I'm just going to give um, a very brief overview of what we'll be covering um, as our panelists get on the screen. I'm starting to see everyone's faces, which is great. Um, and I'm really happy today to be joined by professionals from AIG. Gallagher, The Hartford, and New York Life to really discuss the importance of diversity within the industry. Um, and as a reminder to our panelists, as we kind of dive into these questions, please just remember to state your name um, and your company when you do respond to the questions. And Brandon, if we can go to that next slide, that would be great. Perfect. And then students, as a reminder, um, please feel free to submit questions via the chat. You've submitted so many already, which has been great to see. And we will do our best to either answer them live or our recruiters on the, on the call will message you back directly. Um, but really want to thank our panelists um, for joining us. I think I see everyone on the screen. Great. Um, and we're going to dive right in. 
So for our panelists, um, for our first question that we have is, you know, why is diversity important for our industry as it relates to meeting our clients' needs? And maybe I'll ask Frida to kick us off with that. Sure, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Frida Lee and I am a Senior Vice President with AIG Retirement Services where I lead our strategic accounts uh, relationship management team. And to answer your question, um, the reason it's important is because as we think about our client base and I'll, I'll speak specifically to the side of the business where I operate, um, which is our institutional retirement services practice. We manage retirement plans across multiple service industries. And, and by service, I mean our K through 12, public schools, um, healthcare, higher education, uh, universities, uh, community colleges, as well as healthcare organizations, state and local government. And when we look across industries and you think about people that are represented as employees in America, which is a diverse country, and we want to make sure how they look and um, who they are, and so that we are really a part of, you know, that community as we look to serve them. Um, and, and kind of second part of that um, response, I would say, is as a business person, I think we all have um, agreed, I think we all agree that diversity becomes a business imperative. Um, it, there used, I remember a time when diversity and inclusion was talked about purely in terms of the right thing to do from a social um, standpoint. But when you think about the business imperative it's that are needed to keep this industry competitive and so that we are attracting the best and brightest talent. And in order to do that, I honestly believe we have to look for a diverse um, set of employees because as the market continues to evolve, like every other industry, it becomes really competitive. And we want to attract um, students with different ideas um, more than, you know, you have to go beyond what has been traditionally looked at as insurance and trying to attract students from um, other backgrounds, I think is what will help us grow and sustain a viable um, organization in the future. Thank you so much, Frida. Um, and I'll turn it over to McLee now. Hi all, thanks for having me. McLee Smith, uh, Air President for Gallagher's New York Metro office. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, can't, resoundingly, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to say everything that Frida said, I, I agree with. Um, not much more for me to add, frankly, except to say that uh, there are so many layers to uh, why uh, diversity is important in the, in the business world, right? You look at the culture, you look at the culture within any organization. Um, we, as a, a global company, um, recognize that our company needs to reflect the world. Right. Uh, if we don't reflect the world and we don't create that environment where folks from very, very uh, diverse backgrounds are comfortable within the organization, then obviously that impacts our ability to retain the top talent, as Frida said. So it's really critical that as we recruit, we recruit the best. Um, and the, 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 if we are recruiting the best, then, then that will be uh, that will represent some diversity. In addition to that, we're especially in this environment, what we've been seeing is that more and more of our clients are looking to us um, for diversity in, in the relationships, right? Uh, they've been reaching to us, particularly around what's been happening in the, in, the, in the US the past few months, and they've actually been very direct. And they've said to us, we are looking for diversity. We want to partner, we want to have relationships with folks that look like us, that with folks that, that understand us. And so from a business perspective, it is hugely important um, if, if for nothing else that uh, we create the, the diversity in, in, in the workforce. Um, you know, a couple of other things as well, I, I think are really critical to this. Uh, as we seek to um, create solutions, which is what we do for our clients, right? Our, our job is to get out there from a consulting perspective and create solutions for our clients unless we truly understand the needs of those clients, and those needs are diverse needs quite often, 
then uh, we won't be able to create the, the solutions that matter, the solutions that are relevant to their particular needs. And so, um, you know, there, there are so many layers that um, justify the need for diversity that I think it's unfortunate, frankly, that in our industry, there's not more diversity. Um, you know, Gallagher as a company, you know, has taken the steps, has recognized, first of all, the need to change that, the need to fix that. And, and so we have, we have started uh, with a number of initiatives that are geared towards uh, diversifying the organization and hence us being here. And, and I'm happy to say that the other companies that are involved with this as well feel similarly. So I'm hopeful, right? I'm hopeful that, um, you know, over the next you know, couple of years, as we sit, particularly in leadership meetings, um, we, you know, we're, we're not counting uh, the, the folks that are of diverse backgrounds, right? Because there'll be too many to count. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mick Lee. Um, we'll move to our next question and I'll, I'll pose this first to Priya and then to Taliba. Um, all of our companies offer a form of employee resource or affinity groups to celebrate and highlight diversity. How have these groups advanced a culture of diversity and inclusion? All right, hi everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, Priya Desi Craig, and I'm an attorney at New York Life. So maybe I'm the first attorney that you're hearing from today. No lawyer jokes, please. Okay, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so I'm happy to talk about affinity groups or ERGs, they're called employee resource groups because I've been at New York Life five years. It was my fifth year anniversary just last week. And I joined an ERG when I came. I didn't know too much about it. And I can tell you, it's really like changed my whole perspective on the company and connected me in ways I didn't even think possible. So that's just like my personal experience with it. So New York Life has seven ERGs. Um, they're focused on different areas. For example, there might be like an Asia Pacific one, there might be a Latin one, and you don't really have to be part of that group to join. You could be an ally, you could be interested. It really doesn't matter. You could join more than one. And um, they all work together. There is you know, top-down senior management, total buy-in. So what does that mean? Is that just like, hey, they say, go join an ERG? No. It's actually more than that. So we'll have you know, senior leaders actively involved, helping you plan, strategize, have events. Um, and I can give you one example just from my own personal experience. At New York Life, they have this really fun event called Cheers for Charity. Um, it really is exactly what it sounds like. They have a lounge on the 34th floor. Now this is pre-COVID. Hopefully when we're back in the office, we can enjoy it again. And each ERG sponsors a month. They pick uh, four charities, they vote on it, they choose a charity that's gonna get the proceeds. Everyone makes a nominal contribution. They go up to the lounge in the evening, you get a beverage or two and you mingle with people. So what the ERGs have done is really take it to the next level. They've made it a friendly competition. You involve your senior leaders, they invite the entire teams. You've got a magician one day, another day you have someone playing the guitar and it's just a great way. And Honestly, we raised so much money for charity. People were so engaged. I got so many emails from people saying how much fun they had and they talked to you know, this senior leader or that senior leader, which you know, maybe in your day-to-day -day job, you may not interact with them. So I feel in these ways, like ERGs really sort of take it to the next level and help people get engaged and hone skills that they may not otherwise have had. I was lucky enough to be the co-chair of the Asian ERG for over three years and kind of develop different skills that way. Um, and I feel like doing this while championing diversity and inclusion is really like the best of all worlds, right? And it kind of furthers the goals and you improve yourself and get engaged with the company. And so I think diversity and inclusion and ERGs are really the way to go. Thank you so much, Priya. Uh, and Taliba, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, hello, everyone. My name is Taliba Lynch. I am a director of financial analysis at the Hartford, supporting our middle and large commercial um, organizations, and I'm excited about being here today. Um, I think I echo everything that Priya said. I think ERGs are the foundation of what we're doing. And when I think about even at the Hartford, we started our journey a few years ago by number one, like establishing a foundation for first appreciating differences. Um, and I think that kind of got us grounded in understanding that diversity um, comes through various lenses, whether it's personal style, is it race, is it gender, is it ethnicity, and even your own um, unique life experiences um, lends itself into the diversity lens. Um, I think after that, uh, we were able to just think about it from the perspective of, of landscape and understanding unconscious bias 
and ERGs were at the foundation of what we were doing at the Hartford. So when I think about it, um, kind of where we are today, challenging ourselves to kind of step beyond um, just laying the foundation of knowing the importance of differences, but also understanding that we have to hold ourselves accountable. ERGs have been vital, I think, for us and even for me myself as providing opportunities to just build a support system. Um, I think we look at it a little bit differently from the perspective that not just, um, it, it, it lends us twofold. You have the opportunity to build a support system of those who are similar to you, but also um, being able to have exposure to someone that may be different. So we don't look at ERGs as just something that I, that I, you know, maybe something that I'm used to, but let's join an ERG to find out and learn more about something that's totally different. So we have ERGs, whether it's military ERGs, we have Asian Pacific, we have the Black Insurance Professionals Networks. One of our biggest um, ERGs for the Hartford has been PWN, which is our professional women's network. And we've leveraged ERGs as far as how do we look at culture across the Hartford? How do we think about um, different things that impact our employees, not only inside, but externally? And ERGs have been foundational in doing that um, for us at the Hartford. Thank you so much, Shaliba. Um, I'll move to our next question. And this is going to be you know, posed to all of our panelists. Um, and perhaps we can um, start with Frida on this. But can you share your thoughts on areas of opportunity for the industry as a result of current events, such as the global pandemic and the civil unrest in the United States? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it was McLean that said that a, a number of corporations, including insurance companies, took this opportunity, frankly, of self-reflection for the company to um, speak on what they would do in terms of diversity and inclusion and how we could do a better job um, of in our own um, companies, but also as, as it pertains to the community. So. Um, I, there's been a number of conversations around how do we recruit more? How do we look at who's in our leadership ranks? And I, I think this has been a moment for the country to take stock over how are we uh, living out these diversity and inclusion um, um, things that we Frida, it looks like we're having a hard time hearing you. I'm not sure if you can hear us. It looks like your um, your video may have gone out. Okay, so why don't we, while she's getting back online, let's um, move on maybe to McLee. Would you let, I know you kind of touched on this a bit, but if you want to add anything, um, you know, around this specific question and this topic. Sure, sure. Um, so frankly, I don't think there's there's been a time where there's been a greater need um, for um, diversity, right? As we look at the at the pandemic, um, our companies um, or in our business, right, the consulting side, our clients have leaned on us so heavily in the last couple of months. If you look at the pandemic, you know, just one initiative that that consumed us for the last few months has been to the return to the workplace, right? Uh, in our business, on the benefit side, we normally wouldn't get involved. We wouldn't get engaged typically on, on that type in that type of event. But frankly, um, our clients didn't know where to go. And we have developed these relationships where essentially we're the first place, right? We're the first stop. Uh, if we can't help, we'll figure out how to help them, figure out how to direct them to the right resources. So we've um, sort of broadened the scope of our engagement with so many of our clients to help them with uh, returning to the workplace following um, the pandemic. And that's happening very slowly, even in our own case, right? In our company, it's happening very slowly. Um, around the area of the civil unrest, it's similar as well, right? Our, our clients are reaching out to us and they're asking the questions, what are you guys doing? You know, we, we don't know where to go with this. Um, what what are you doing? So that's when we, we you know, we've engaged um, or consulting resources within our our own organization, right? Human resource consulting. And we, we've said to them, all right, we'll make these resources available to you to help you navigate the space, to educate your, your employees, to help you create that safe space for your employees to express how they're feeling. Because frankly, that's been one of the big challenges over the past few months, right? Um, and it's the unseen challenge, the unseen challenge of the stress and the emotional uh, issues associated with everything that's happening. Who could have imagined, right, a, a year like this? No one. Um, and so what we've tried to do is to be that resource to our clients. Uh, and I think we've done a pretty good job 
um, of being that resource based on the feedback we've been getting. And who knows, we're not at the end yet. We still have a couple months to go. So who knows what's around the corner. Hopefully it, it's better, but we as an organization will need to evolve. We as an industry will need to evolve and to adapt uh, and to, to make sure that we, we put ourselves in position to be that resource to our clients, to whatever comes along, because we, we're in a relationship business and by virtue of that, uh, we're quite often one of the first stops for our clients. Uh, and so we have to be prepared and we have to be ready to, to assist them. Thank you so much, McLee. Um, Taliba, what are your thoughts on this topic? Um, excellent Tom, question. And I am um, actually excited again uh, about the opportunity to participate today. So. When I think about everything that's going on, and let's let's maybe we'll start with just in general. I think this is a great opportunity for the insurance gen, um, industry in general to continue to move the needle forward and push and um, continue to promote diversity overall. When I think about the global pandemic, um, and I think everyone has been impacted by it, and McLean made a great point, like you know, with everyone having remote work. ERGs and just diversity in general. One of the things that I think about that's near and dear to me is uh, the, even at the Hartford, we had an opportunity to challenge ourselves. Normally we bring in interns um, and with the pandemic, uh, we can't, we couldn't bring in the interns in um, physically like we would have normally did, but we had to challenge ourselves to use our resources differently. And we still had our internship program and we did it virtually. So it causes us to think about things differently. How do you leverage technology? How do you make them feel engaged? Um, even along the same lines with everything that's going on with civil unrest and everything that's going on within this nation, um, every every employee, um, even in, whether they're in the ins insurance industry or outside of the in insurance industry is impacted by what's going on. So how do you bring your whole self to work still knowing that you still have to deal with these things and leveraging um, one tool that we have um, that we tried to utilize here at the Hartford is having courageous conversations, meaning, how are you? Like, you know, have a, a, a real conversation. Are you, how are you feeling today? And while we may not have had those conversations in the past, um, leveraging some tools, we're able to do that today in order to support one another and just be there. And also just think about that as we think about the future and how we progress, um, whether it's supporting our customers, whether it's supporting our clients um, and things overall. So I think we're on the, the right road, but there's definitely more opportunity for us to grow and develop. Thank you, Taliba. And Priya, your thoughts? Sure. Um, so I, I agree with sort of all my fellow panelists. I think they raised excellent points and I'll try not to repeat any. I think you're right, the industry seems to be headed the right way. And this conversation is definitely affirming that for me. Um, some of the things that New York Life has done in terms of specific examples, you know, our CEO came out with a statement right away uh, in response to the civil unrest, um, kind of, you know, restating the commitment to diversity and inclusion and, and, and social justice. And some ways they've sort of implemented this is they've set up a steering committee headed by the CEO um, and a working group. And they're really looking at everything. Everything's on the table. They're doing a deep dive of everything diversity and inclusion related, all our policies, everything to just see, kind of examine it, look at ways, is it working, bring some transparency and what could we do better, right? Like this is the time now that the spotlight is on um, diversity and inclusion and, and social justice. This is a really good time to take stock of what we've done and see ways we can improve. So coming back to courageous conversations that Saliba mentioned, um, one of the things we've done is we've instituted these sort of color brave conversations where you have to sit in a room with other people who you may not know, and frankly, talk on a tough topic of you know race. That's not an easy topic. Like, you know, when I, when I first joined the workforce, you never talked about race or religion. Like that was just taboo, right? And that the company is kind of empowering you to have these conversations and giving you tools um, shows sort of that the importance of it and you know how it kind of makes you more connected as a group. Um, if you understand what your colleagues are going through um, and it's a safe space to talk. And that's really the goal here. I can see tell you not. And we've had ones where, you know, on before this pandemic and before the civil unrest, we had some on, you know, sort of hate speech and how to deal with hate speech and, you know, implicit bias. And, 
you know, it's kind of shocking when you do those trainings, you're like, oh, I didn't realize I had those, you know, let me work on it. And that's why I feel like this is, to your point, just moving the ball forward and furthering the industry's commitment to diversity and inclusion. Thank you so much, everyone. We have a couple of questions that have come in uh, to the chat um, that would love to, you know, kind of hear your feedback on. Um, so the first question is, are LGBTQ plus um, individuals welcomed in the insurance industry? Um, so I think we may have touched a bit on this with the conversation about employee resource and affinity groups, but would love, you know, anyone's perspective um, on this if you'd like to jump, jump in. I'm also happy to, you know, kind of share from an HR perspective as well. So we'll turn it over to anyone who's interested in anything. So I don't mind. I'll I'll take that if you don't mind. So um, definitely they are welcome. Specifically within the Hartford, we have a, um, ERGs that are 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 specifically set up for that group that particular um, 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 group um, to make sure that they feel inclusive, um, to make sure that they feel engaged, to make sure that they can have the conversation and the support system. Uh, more recently, before the pandemic, um, we recently made changes even within our buildings um, as far as the bathrooms, talking about, you know, whether it's male or female or he or she. So, um, and we're leveraging the power of the ERG to make sure that we have voices who can speak um, and make sure that we're moving things in the right direction to make sure that we drive an inclusive environment to make sure that everyone comes to the table because that's what diversity is about. Thank you so much, Taliba. And I'll also just say from a recruiting and um, HR perspective, I think a number of our companies participate in the Out for Undergraduate um, conference that takes place every year um, and really look forward to engaging with students um, who identify as part of that population. Um, it is a part of our diversity strategy and initiatives, and we really welcome anyone who's interested in the industry um, to reach out um, to learn about our opportunities. Um, and then one of the other questions we'd love to have you all answer is, you know, how do you all think about partnering with cultural communities where you do business? Um, this is an important part of our diversity strategy, but we don't always talk as much about that, um, but would love anyone's thoughts on that. So it's Frida, I'm back. <laughs> um, thank I you guys for being patient. I had to switch laptops. Um, yeah, so we've been partnering with our communities and especially with our historically black colleges and universities. Um, and one, it's been twofold. One, they are a client of ours. A number of those universities are clients of ours, but two, it's been helpful for us to identify students um, in terms of recruiting efforts where we haven't done as well. Um, with some of those schools, but also helping and partnering with them in the community. Um, and I think that's particularly important as we, um, we found that a lot of people didn't know what we did, right? We had students, we showed up to a career fair, and there simply wasn't an awareness of who we were or what opportunities existed in the insurance business. So it gave us an opportunity to be more present um, in the industry, to be more present in the community, um, but to also do good in the community by partnering with those known um, institutions in the city and, and making sure that we not only got our name out there from a, this is a great place to work um, standpoint, but also being a better corporate and business. Um, um, I look at it as being, being, being a good neighbor, right? Because we're down the street from a number of these large institutions and frankly, really hadn't sought opportunities as much as we probably should have. Um, to collaborate with them on how do we serve the community, how do we do things that are important to them to help raise the need for um, the importance of higher education, and how do we um, partner with them on financial literacy, which we've done with some of the school districts um, in areas where we serve. So I think as we do more of that, um, it's, it's the doing good part that I really appreciate, but it also helps the company from a branding standpoint where they we are seen as being active in the community and our name gets out there where people start to see it as an employer that they could certainly um, look to for, for a career at some point. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Frida. And I see that we're coming up on the 30 minutes. And so I just really want to thank all of our panelists um, for your insights and our students for your questions. This has been a wonderful discussion um, and I think very timely. And I look forward to us hopefully continuing these conversations. And as Priya and I think McLean mentioned and all of you touched on really having these courageous conversations is so important. Um, and I know that we're all very inspired by the generation of students that um, are applying for our programs and you know how candid you all are. And we appreciate that so much. 
Um, we are now going to transition to our breakout session. So for our students, you should have received a link to the session that you signed up for, either virtual networking or digital interviewing. So if you can go ahead um, and click that Zoom link, we will get started in just a couple of minutes. Um, we think these will be really helpful um, tactical sessions for you to learn some really critical skills as you navigate this virtual landscape over the next few months um, with applying and interviewing. So again, thank you to our panelists. I want to thank all of uh, the firms that have participated and please join us in just a minute for our virtual networking and digital interviewing breakout sessions. 